So then if we take the least significant bit, move that forward, we get the A. That is awesome. We have generated a serial signal. So move up that and we'll get... Hello and welcome back. So what I've got here is an FTDI cable. It's a USB device, but it's talking the 5 volt UART protocol that is often used by Arduinos or Raspberry Pis or a lot of other different basic circuits. The signals are very similar to the what you used to get on the 9-pin serial ports on the back of most computers, with the exception that this one runs at 5 volts and not the 12 volts that RS-232 used to use. Now it's very common for circuits to have support for UART transmission, and so it's kind of useful to look at ways of building circuits that can talk this, so particularly if you're doing something like building a old-style 8-bit CPU, then it's nice to be able to build a circuit that can talk to a wide range of pre-existing hardware. Let's get this plugged into the PC and have a look at the signals it generates. Okay, so this has shown up as COM4. So I'm going to use this program called PuTTY to talk to it. For the board rate, I'm going to select 115200. This is probably one of the most common bit rates that are used on UARTs these days. Slower speeds like 9600 used to be very common, but um, I think I see this used most now. Now these are the main configuration options that matter. Now, I've only ever seen anything use 8 bits of data. Um, sometimes you see two stop bits. There's always at least one start bit and parity odd or even. Um, but in this case, we're going to select none because it makes the protocol simpler. I may talk about parity in a future video. OK, so I've got my terminal window and it doesn't do anything. But very simply, I could take the transmit and receive lines and cross connect them. And now I can type on the keyboard and get the value echoed straight back to me. But what's much more interesting is if we fire up the oscilloscope and take a look at the actual signal. Okay, so the black wire is going to be ground. Okay, so I'm just hitting the space bar to generate the appropriate keystrokes code. Right, capital A. I know that the ASCII for a capital A is 65. So we're seeing the start bit here, where the line initially goes low, followed by the least significant bit, bit zero, is high for a one, and then bit 6 is high for 64, bit 7 is 0, and then we get the stop bit, which is the signal returning to a high state. So the stop bit is always high, and the start bit is always low, and that means that receive circuitry can trigger on that edge transition. Go for a lowercase a there, and we can uh, see that extra bit for 32 come on. or we can count our way up the alphabet and see the classic binary counting in the oscilloscope trace, even though we have to read the bits from left to right instead of right to left. OK, now I want to build a circuit to do this. Now, initially, I think the simplest thing to do would be to generate a signal. I'm going to need a breadboard, and I've got some new ones. The previous seller I've used uh, wasn't selling anymore, so this is a new seller. I don't know if these are going to be good. Right, visually these look pretty good. They've got the continuous bus lines across the top and bottom, which I like. Plastic actually feels quite nice and the printing's clear. Okay, what's interesting here is there is actually power and ground coming in from this cable. 
I presume I can use that to power this circuit. Now let's say I want to go with that 115,200 hertz signal. Now to generate that I'm going to need a clock that runs at that frequency and they don't appear to exist. Now what does exist is these. This is a 1.84320 megahertz crystal oscillator. Now these seem quite common but they're mostly SMD versions now so I had to get the uh, dip one off eBay. So if we give this power it should generate a nice 1.84 megahertz signal. Okay, now this is higher frequency than anything I've ever used before. Well, so the scope is showing 1.8431 megahertz, so that's pretty close. A bit bouncy though. Okay, that doesn't seem to have helped it. I think we may just have to accept that uh, high frequency on a breadboard is a bit rubbish. This signal is it's comfortably inside the tolerances for TTL, so I think it's workable. Okay, so 1.8432. Now this is common because it's a common multiplier of the board rates we're common to see. Now in relation to 115.2 kilohertz, it's 16 times that. So we need to divide this clock rate by 16. I'm actually going to turn this around to create some more space. Okay, dividing by 16 is actually going to be fairly straightforward. So this is a 74LS193. So this is the kind of counter chip that I've been using in the CPU build. And I've used these for a few other purposes because I've got a whole bunch of these. But we could use probably a any one of a variety of counter chips. I don't think there's anything particularly special about this. In fact, it's probably overkill because it's got the up and down count. Okay, so we need to tie the clear down. Count down, we need to tie high. And this is parallel load. That needs to be high. So when the clock goes into the count up, and then the carry out should show us a lower frequency. Okay, what we're seeing here is the, the carry signal, which is going to be half of one of the incoming clocks. So if instead we go and look at the least significant bit, there you go, that's our 1 16th clock rate. Now we're seeing a little bit of noise on the line here for each of the higher frequency clock ticks, but it is in spec. Okay, now we need to divide this signal up further. Now the most simple form of the UART transmission has eight data bits, a start and a stop bit. So if we want to repeatedly send like that, we've got a, a repeating cycle of 10 bits. Now we might want to add additional stop bits or a parity bit, but we can pad it with a high line as much as we want. So I'm actually going to round that up to a 16-bit cycle, purely because it now allows us to simplify this circuit slightly. We've already got a trivial example of a circuit here that will loop around every 16 cycles. Now doing one for 10 cycles, we could do with um, an extra comparator. But 16 cycles is going to be easy for us. So we'll do that with another 74LS193 chip. Ah, this is the HCT one I uh, got during the CPU build to check HCT was behaving the way I thought it would. I'll leave that in. Got mixed up with my LS ones. So the pattern here is going to be exactly the same. Count down, we pull high. It's the master reset and the parallel load. In this case, I'm going to use the clock 
we've got over here that we've already divided by 16. I'm going to put that into a count up line. And then we can examine the output there. Okay, that looks good. But in this case, I think we will use that carry line. There you go. So that's a, a distinct tick every 16 cycles. Okay, so I'm going to change that to trigger off channel 2, which is the purple line. Now we can get the yellow one and let's go and look at the clock again. Just about got one whole loop on the screen. That's cool. Let's see if we can tidy this up as we go. Okay, so we need to generate the bit stream. I'd like to give one of these 74LS165s a try. This is an 8 bit parallel in serial out shift register. Sounds about right for us. So you've got eight input bits and a bunch of control lines. Okay, logic diagram. And what we've actually got here is eight latches. They're a little bit more complex than the basic latches we've been using elsewhere because they can each load from one of two locations. So a shift load line will cause it to load from the parallel inputs, whereas if that's high, it actually loads from the output of the previous latch in the chain. Pretty easy to imagine the circuit that would do that. So then each time it clocks, it outputs one bit and all we have is move up one slot. So yes, there's an input, so we could chain two of these together. That's exactly what we need. Okay, it's so a clock inhibit line here. That's actually the same as the clock line. So I'm guessing on shift load, it's just going to be the low state or the rising edge triggers the data load, and we just shouldn't be clocking during that time. Okay, let's get one of these chips and wire it in. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's pull that clock inhibit down. Want to clock from the pre-existing clock line. Let's try taking the load from the carry out that we've been monitoring. All right, so there's an output over here. And we've got a serial input here. That's cool. Okay, so what we've got there is we're shifting out eight bits which are all low, interesting. And then for the second eight slots, we're outputting whatever's coming into the, um, the serial shift in. There you go. So there's actually two outputs here. One is inverted and one isn't. So that's now gonna respond the way we expect. So this is a, B, C, D. Okay, so these are in the reverse order. Okay, so then that's E, F, G, H. That should be the first bit. Okay, as expected, that's actually covering two spaces. Okay, what we'd need to do is add circuitry to stop the clock or use the clock disable line there. Or we could just leave that one high and call that the start bit. Let's do that. I'm going to hardwire those ones. So then that's bit zero, bit one. Now, I'm going to want a second one of these because we've only got six bits generated and we need to be generating nine bits beyond here. Okay. 
Okay, well, I want the output of this one to go to the input of this one over here. I'm going to chain on that clock line as well. And that load signal. Okay, the input of this one, I think we want to just send that permanently high. I don't see us. Yeah, we're not. We're never actually going to see that. Okay, so all the inputs on here have gone high naturally. I should be able to pull them low. So this, that's the stop bit is going to be high already, and then all the remaining bits that we're generating but don't actually need will all be high. I think we just need H and G out of here. There. So let's clear our contents. I think it was white over here was our input. Right, so let's try and generate capital A. So it's going to be 65. Okay, so what we've got there is 64, which is that at symbol. So then if we take the least significant bit, move that forward, we get the A. That is awesome. We have generated a serial signal. So move up that and we'll get a C. And drop the least significant bit back down, we'll get the B. Okay, that's great. I'm really chuffed with that. Okay, um, that almost felt too easy. Um, what can we do that's more interesting? Okay, um, there's a 193. I had a few of those lying around already. Actually going to get used as a standard 4-bit counter again. It's the parallel load. Okay, need you to move. Master reset. Got one of those breadboard holes, it doesn't want to take a pin. Pull the count down high and then so count up. Let's take that from that load signal. So that'll be each time this loads a new value to be shifted out. We'll actually increment this. So then that's the least significant bit. Let's go and get that into bit zero of the counter. Okay, that doesn't look like it's counting. Yeah, so power. Ground. That's not master reset. That is master reset. Okay, so now we're toggling that bottom bit, bottom two bits. So we get that at symbol, which is ASCII 64. The next two bits are over here. So that is happily going through the at symbol in the first 15 characters of the alphabet. Oh, that's cool. That proves it works pretty effectively. So there we go. Switch to lowercase with that bit. It's quite nice the way the ASCII table has um, powers of two between some of the, uh, the key segments. So we can change case with uh, just a one bit difference. Okay, well, I am really pleased with that. Okay, now, repeating this same 8 bits out, or, well, adding this test circuit on the end, isn't really quite complete. What we actually want is some kind of a register-like structure to hold the data to be transmitted, and when we load it, we activate the, the shift out. And that would give us the circuitry we need to actually start thinking about interfacing it to 
something like my CPU build or a similar type of circuit. I want to do a receive circuit. That will be quite interesting as well. The fact that the clock rate is actually higher than the bit rate, I think is going to come in handy to do that. But with this kind of short series, I, I'm kind of open about how much I focus on different things. I mean, do you want to see me interfacing this to the CPU or do you want to see the receive? I could maybe do some buffering. I could do a parity circuit. I'm open to some suggestions on, uh, on where to spend the time focusing. I'll definitely do a receive and an interface. I really enjoyed putting together this circuit. I very much hope you all found it interesting and I will continue this again soon. Goodbye.